and welcome to this webcast lecture on David Ricardo, the early 19th century economist and author of The Principles of Political Economy and Taxation. Ricardo was a follower of Adam Smith. He was an empiricist and he accepted most of Smith's system. In fact, his book, The Principles of Political Economy, is largely a commentary on Smith's work, The Wealth of Nations. One of Ricardo's main criticisms of Smith is on the concept of value, the value at which goods and services will exchange. He notes that Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations says that the word value has two different meanings and sometimes expresses the utility of some particular object and sometimes the power of purchasing other goods which the possession of that object conveys. The one we may call the value in use or the use value and the other is the exchange value. And Smith also notes uh, things which often have the greatest value, use value or utility value frequently have no exchange value at all. And he gives the example of air and water. There's nothing with greater utility than air and water because without them we would die. But because they are abundant, plentiful, then they have no exchange value. On the other hand, gold, says Adam Smith, has very little use value compared at least with air and water and with the necessity of staying alive. Yet gold has a very high exchange value, meaning you can trade gold for huge quantities of air and water and many other things. Ricardo says that Smith is barking up the wrong tree because the true value of things is um, dependent upon how much necessary labour power has gone into them. Thus, uh, air and water are free, or virtually free, in a country like England, water is virtually free, it's so plentiful, and that means it's got nothing to do with its use value. It's uh, entirely down to the fact that very little labour is needed to provide it. Once you've built the reservoir and the plumbing system, the cost of turning the tap is virtually zero. Therefore, there is no exchange value because there's no labour value needed or entailed in producing the glass of water. Gold, on the other hand, may have relatively little utility but a huge amount of labour power is necessary to produce it. And he's not just thinking here of the, um, the mining process and the smelting process, but the whole business of creating mining equipment in the first place. You would have to, the, to sink the mine into the ground and all the hauling equipment and all of that. So all of that is entailed in the labour value of, of an ounce of gold when it's produced always very, very, very high. Uh, Ricardo concedes that for something to have any exchange value at all, having any price, uh, it must have at least some utility. So gold does indeed have utility, rather a lot of utility. It's, uh, it's simply pleasurable to look at on the one hand as jewellery. And because it's widely accepted gold as a store of value, it can be used for currency. So it's actually a relatively useful uh, material. It's also, so gold does indeed have uh, some u utility. But Ricardo's point still stands. The reason why it's so expensive is that it's expensive to produce in terms of labour power, at least relative to other commodities such as water. So for Ricardo, this is a kind of a two-stage process. The ultimate value of things is dependent upon their embodied labour power. Price at which they will exchange in the market is simply the interplay of supply and demand. The scarcity factor does come into this. So if you take an example where, for the sake of simplicity, we say that a bottle of wine takes exactly twice as much labour power to produce as a loaf of bread, then you will get uh, an exchange system whereby two loaves of bread are equivalent to a bottle of wine. So if you have a currency system where a bottle of wine is one euro, then a loaf of bread will be half a euro. But equally, you, the bottle of wine could be 200 euros or 2 million euros or something, and the loaves of bread would be 1 million euros because the, the currency effect is really only nominal. Those prices will adjust themselves exactly to the embodied labour power. Now, in the short term, people may sell the wine too expensive because, you know, the, the, the wine merchant is not sitting there thinking, I wonder how much embedded labour there is in this. He's thinking, how much can I sell this for? And if you put it out there for three or four euros, three or four times the price of a loaf of bread, then he's going to stay on the shelf. Now, he might get a few suckers in there, but basically he's going to have a problem. He's not going to be able to sell it. He's going to cut it. If he cuts it too much, if he cuts it down to half a euro, half the price of a loaf of bread, when really it's worth two loaves of bread, then it's going to sell very, very quickly. And he's going to run out of stock and he's going to find he can put the price up. So ultimately, the interplay of supply and demand, the scarcity factors that Adam Smith uh, wrote about so effectively, the utility and the 
factors of demand will um, interact to produce a stable price, but that price in the long term will track the relative labour power that's gone in to these products. It follows that over time that the price structure of the economy will change according to the amount of investment in producing this or that good. If we now build a, a big bread factory so that so we can reduce the amount of um, fresh labour that has to go in to produce a loaf, then th those loaves will go down in price relative to wine if we're making the wine in traditional, organic, old-fashioned ways. Um, obviously, the new mass-produced, factory-produced bread will be cheaper, but uh, it will also include uh, an element of cost for the capital investment. Um, the embedded labour of the people who built the factory and who built the machines that b built the factory and the machines that built the machines that built the factory and all the rest of it will, will be in there somewhere. If you keep wine being hand-produced uh, while bread is mechanised or vice versa, then ultimately the price of bread will fall. There'll be fluctuations in markets as the supply and demand mechanism comes in there, but ultimately the level of investment in the economy will determine price structure. So the labour theory of value is the most significant thing about Ricardo from our point of view, not the only significant thing though, and we should mention his concept of the diminishing marginal return on investment in capital. What this means is that the first thousand pounds that you invest in uh, improving the productivity of a factory or a mine will produce most of the value that you're going to get out of it. The subsequent, inv the next thousand pounds you put in won't produce as much additional efficiency. The third one thousand pounds still less and still less and so on until eventually you have to put huge amounts of capital into a business in order to keep increasing its viability. So this, th this creates a law that new industries new productive units are always more effective, more efficient than trying to recapitalise old ones. That's a very important idea for the English economy in the 19th century, which was all about innovation and new processes of various sorts. So there we have David Ricardo. Like Smith, he was in favour of free markets, free trade and the price mechanism. He was an advocate of the repeal of the Corn Laws, but his intellectual breakthroughs in the field of labour theory of value and in the diminish law of diminishing marginal returns were to have a very, very big impact on the development of economics as a science in the 19th and 20th centuries.